morning, everybody. My name is Olia Fromo. I'm one of the senior residents here at Wills, and I have the pleasure of presenting today's first case. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this uh, presentation. And our case is a 22-year-old female presents with painless central vision loss in the left eye for about two years. On presentation, her corrected visual acuity is 2100 in the right eye and 2400 in the left eye. Her pressures are 15 and 16. Her pupils are round, equal, and reactive, and there's no APD. Confrontation visual fields are fooled, and extraocular motility is full as well. Um, on her slit lamp examination, is overall unremarkable. We do see evidence of prior cataract extraction bilaterally and vitrectomy bilaterally. Um, her past medical history, she's overall a very healthy 22-year-old uh, female. She only reports history of vitro retinal surgery years ago. We were able to obtain outside hospital records from her previous physician. Um, Dr. Spurn, are you able to uh, interpret this OCT findings for us, please? Sure. Um, so one comment, the fact that she's 22 and has had bilateral vitrectomies is pretty unusual. <laughs> Um, this is an OCT of the right eye, and well, you can see in the near infrared, there's this area of fluid here, which corresponds to this area in here. Uh, there might be a little bit of epiretinal membrane on the surface, but it looks like about it. We have one more image as well from her fellow eye right here. So looks similar. I mean, you got this area here, maybe here or here, and there's some fluid corresponding to that area over there. Choroid doesn't look too thick. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see the the interface with the vitreous and the retina. So maybe they induced a PVD, or maybe it's just not present. It's hard to tell if maybe something is is right there, but it's hard to tell in these images. Mm -hmm. On the upper image, on the upper image, someone was pointing out there looks like there's trace intraretinal edema. <laughs> And uh, it's difficult to appreciate on the infrared photos, but there is a um, kind of like a darker oval shape uh, depression at the temporal edges of the optic nerves. And she, um, on the fundoscopic exam, unfortunately we don't have a picture from that time, she had uh, bilateral optic pits. And she underwent um, a vitrectomy uh, for the optic disc pit maculopathy. And her left eye, her presenting eye that she presented to us with worse vision, was actually her good eye. And her vision in that eye postoperatively um, 10 years ago was 2040. Uh, so, um, in this patient, um, you know, with uh, a very young 11-year-old at that time, uh, with classic appearance of optic nerves um, and bilateral serous retinal detachment, the diagnosis was fairly obvious, uh, but there is, um, uh, one needs to consider these, uh, um, these uh, these diagnoses when we see a patient with serious retinal detachments. And I just want to briefly uh, mention uh, before we go into um, um, our exam about optic disc pits. Uh, they are on a spectrum of a rare congenital cavernous anomalies of optic disc. Um, they usually present a, the, a gray oval shaped excavation, usually at the inferior temporal edge of the disc. Um, uh, on the spectrum is also optic disc colobomas, which are larger excavations, usually inferiorly, um, and uh, as well as morning uh, glory disc anomalies, which are large papillae with funnel-shaped excavation associated with radially oriented um, retinal vessels. Um, as well as circumpopular elevated pigmentary uh, tissue. Um, so the histologically optic disc pits usually um, represent a herniation of dysplastic retina into the subarachnoid uh, space through the 
uh, defect into the, in the lamina cribrosa. They're usually unilateral, but uh, up to 15% has been reported bilateral, like in our patient. And the incidence um, is usually uh, one in 11,000 people. Um, so up to disc megalopathy, like of an hour patient, um, it refers to the presence of intraretinal and subretinal fluid in the macula that uh, sometimes lead to serious retinal detachments. And uh, the pathogenesis is thought to involve vitreous liquefaction and traction, but um, it's also been reported in pediatric patients where, where vitreous has not uh, liquefied yet. And it, there has been debate as to the fluid source, vitreous, cerebrospinal, leakage from the blood vessels, and choroid. Um, uh, Dr. Spurn, uh, or anyone else in the audience, uh, what kind of management options do you have uh, for uh, serous retinal detachments, uh, especially associated with optic dispits? So I think you have them listed here. This is, this is a pretty tricky problem to treat. Um, but usually my first treatment is observation mm -hmm. if they're young. And oftentimes, they'll sort of wax and wane over time. Sometimes they go away for long periods of time, so I think observation is reasonable. Um, some of us will do laser photocoagulation, which is basically laser right sort of the disc margin to try to um, prevent that fluid from going from the vitreous cavity underneath the retina, if that truly is the source. Um, there, you can do a pneumatic gas injection with face down positioning. Um, I've never seen that work, but I guess it's possible. I've never tried macular buckling. And then I guess sort of the most aggressive treatment is pars plana Um Most of our studies on this so sh usually show kind of equal results for almost all these. Maybe a little bit better for vitrectomy. Um, when you do a vitrectomy, there's a lot of different techniques you could consider um, once you get in there. Um, usually if we peel ILM, we try not to peel ILM over the fovea because sometimes they end up with a macular hole mm -hmm. after the surgery. Um, you can use glue. Um, but oftentimes, just doing a vitrectomy and releasing the hyloid is enough to get things um, released. Sometimes you can put a little laser. Laser is a little bit easier in the operating room with the patient um, anesthetized. Oftentimes, these are younger patients, and they don't stay so still. So when you're trying to do focal laser, um, it can be tough, especially if you're trying to put that laser right mm -hmm. up against the nerve. So Thank yeah, you. a lot of treatments, none are great. And in this case, for example, you can see if the vitreous is really stuck down, as you pull it up, you do worry that you're going to unreath, as, as just as Dr. Spurt is saying, a macular hole. Mm -hmm. um, now, their vision still may be better because they've got a big detachment and a small hole may be yeah. better than that, but it's still disappointing when that happens. And mm -hmm. Hold on, Dr. Hale, turn your mic on, please. Okay. I was trying to save batteries. <laughs> well, that's good to save money. <laughs> I think we should always Thank think you. about budgetary considerations. <laughs> um, and the other thing is it can take a long time for all the fluid to go away. And typically, you have a lot of schesis fluid as well as uh, in addition to the subretinal fluid. And that can take, I mean, I've even seen you know, six months or a year before it finally flattens completely out. Thank you. And so going back to our patients, so this is the patient, um, this is the photograph that I was staying on the first day, and the vision in the right eye is 2100. And um, Dr. Mita, do you mind describing this fundus photograph, please? You can see um, the peripapillary RP atrophy, likely corresponding to where the laser treatment was done, and the macular macular RPE changes um, and the central fovea. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a photograph of the presenting eye, uh, but this is a representative picture of the macular pathology um, and visual acuity is 2400. And it, the diagnosis is not a secret here. We see a large macular hole, just like as Dr. Hollow mentioned, sometimes um, can uh, ensue after following the tracheotomy. And we have. Is that our, is that our patient? This is not our patient. Uh, no, it's just uh, we don't have a picture from so that time. Can you go Correct. back to that last uh, color picture of the real patient? Yeah. Yeah, so there's something that um, is important 
to, to realize is that there are anomalous vessels almost every time you see an optic disc pit. And just like the optic nerve hasn't formed properly, the vasculature and the normal, is it called the boundary tissue of Kunt? Is that the, the, the proper name? Um, Ooh. Um, <laughs> uh, around the disc um, is improperly formed as well. Um, so there's probably a myriad of reasons why the fluid builds up. Um, abnormal uh, fluid probably coming in from uh, the vitreous cavity, um, but uh, people have seen these vessels leaking, and uh, gas was one of the first to recognize that, and that probably has something to do with it. There's abnormal um, formation of the normal blood retinal barriers surrounding the disc. Thank you, Dr. Polita. And then we have a few OCT images. Oh yeah, did, did that patient have previous laser, I'm assuming, at the time of vitrectomy? Is that what we, we think this is? Uh, yes, we don't have records, but that's what we we're okay. assuming, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess the teaching in the past is that you could laser about 180 degrees of the disc without losing vision, mm -hmm. and they went pretty close. <laughs> We used to always say save two clock hours on that side, you know, for some extra radio. I, I was, I thought it was pretty aggressive laser too. Yeah, I, I would, I wouldn't have been that aggressive. And then we have a few OCT images. Uh, Dr. Meda, do you mind describing what you see here? Sure. So this is OCT macula through the right eye. We can see retinal thinning. There is RPE atrophy with um, increased signal. No macular hole, uh, no macular edema, mm -hmm. choroidal thinning. Mm -hmm. And we have a few images of the fallow eye as well. Here. So on this side, we see a large macular hole mm -hmm. with retinal thinning and um, thin choroid. Yeah. And there's also some um, increased hyperreflectivity here. This might be chronic, a chronic macular hole, because we can see thinner retina, larger diameters, and um, smaller macular hole height. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so how do you approach this patient? So she's a 22-year-old. She already had previous vitrectomy. Um, and uh, she had uh, two, actually, prior surgeries for a macular hole. What kind of options do we have? So uh, so if, we, if the ILM has already been peeled in this patient, um, one option is to do an autologous, autologous ILM flap where another area of the ILM is uh, removed and placed into the macular hole. Um, another option is to do an autologous uh, retinal transplant. Mm -hmm. So uh, part of the retina is removed outside the arcades and placed into the macular hole. Um, and uh, if, if the island, it sounds like the island's already been broadly peeled. If it wasn't, uh, then you could do a uh, vitrectomy with ILM um, inverted flap over a large macular hole. Thank you. Um, and uh, we decided to proceed with, uh, with vitrectomy oil and autologous retinal transplantation. Uh, Can I ask just a quick question? I'm a little confused. So the the pictures that you showed originally, was that before the That was first uh, 10 years prior. That, those were from old Zai pictures. Hospital. Yes. Mm -hmm. Before. That was after the original vitrectomy for the optic pit maculopathy. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And postoperatively, the patient has a macular, macular hole in the no. left eye, and the right eye has lots of laser. Correct. Yes. So it, it looks like probably in that left eye that they probably peeled ILM, mm -hmm. which is just what you said, which is probably why do. they developed a large <laughs> macular hole. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as you're sort of preoperatively planning, I'm guessing maybe we didn't do the first surgery if I had a guess, but I, I'm not sure. Um, when you're planning your second surgery, it's nice to know if they've had ILM peeled because mm 
that definitely limits the opportunity to put an ILM flap. You're basically, you're either going to try to hinge your flap from further away, you're going to try to hinge it over the, the fovea, or you need a free ILM flap. Um, so, or you can do something like an amniotic membrane um, prior to trying an autologous retinal transplant. The autologous retinal transplant has a significant risk. You're basically cutting out a piece of retina and you know, you can either get bleeding or detachment. Um, so I think that's, it's a great option for some, but it's, it's an aggressive option that has significant risk. So is your primary goal in repairing this to A, prevent regmatogenous detachment, or B, to repair the vision? The primary goal in this case was to uh, restore visual acuity. What's the chance that uh, taking a, a flap of retina from outside the macula, what's the chance that it's going to improve the vision? So yeah. there, there are some studies on this um, uh, based out of Europe, actually. And there was, with a large macular hole and inverted ILM flap technique, they got a 90% closure rate. Um, there's also the temporal inverted flap technique, and they had good closure rates with that as well. Um, the goal here would be to uh, get back some central vision uh, for this patient. Uh, but I think we're talking about with the retinal transplant, though. Yeah, so I think the outcomes are probably better with an ILM flap than with a retinal transplant. I think the vision in the other eye was 2100. Mm -hmm. I think the chance of having useful vision that's better than 2100 in the left eye, it's possible, but small. Mm -hmm. um, but the chance of having a regmatogenous detachment from this are small, very small. This is Ajay. I'm just uh, chiming in from the road. Do you guys hear me? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, we can. Uh, <laughs> we heard the road. Um, I was just going to uh, chime in. So for the ILM flaps, uh, this size hole is way bigger than what's been published for most of the ILM flap studies. Um, I think that it's it's less likely to work in this case. Um, for Dr. Shield's question about the vision recovery, it seems like there's a pretty big spectrum for patients who undergo the autologous transplant. There's some patients where it's, it looks like it's purely anatomical and they just don't really get much of a gain. And then there's a separate group that looks like they do actually improve vision. When you look at it um, for the average, it's overall like a statistically significant improvement that they have in their studies. Uh, but it definitely looks like when you look at the individual patients, there's kind of two camps. Somewhere it actually helps, and somewhere it doesn't really help too much. Was that God talking? Yes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, so going forward here, and this is a schematic diagram, what um, a very simplified of what a retinal transplant might look like. Uh, you select a harvest site. Um, and then you apply the endolaser laser and as well as diathermy and then using vertical scissors excise a peripheral part of retina and using ILM forces you bring it over to cover the macular hole defect um, that's surrounding the heart sized with the laser. Um, so this is on post-operative day one after the autologous retinal transplant. Uh, the graft was in place and anatomically macular hole was um, closed. Um, two weeks postoperatively, the patient presented um, for scheduled follow-up. Um, and here we can see that inferior harvest side with some intraretinal hemorrhage. And there's a, a hazy view to the macula as there's silicone oil. And on um, there we have two um, fundus autofluorescent images. Um, Dr. Spurn, are you able to uh, describe these images for us briefly? Uh, not really. <laughs> I'm not sure what we're trying to highlight. Maybe this, um, maybe this area here. Mm -hmm. Yes, what correct. We're trying yeah. to highlight exactly, and that's a, a shifted. Uh, the graft was found to be a shifted um, inferiorly I somewhat. Yeah. I don't know if that's sort of the edge of the hole. Mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe there's still a little bit of edge of hole here. So it's partially covering the hole? Yes, and it was displaced. Um, and we have an OCT image that clearly kind of shows that the graft is, um, has been moved. And so 
um, at this time, the decision was made to go back into the operating room to reposition the graft. And we actually have a video from the operating room um, showing that procedure. So um, the, the graft uh, following um, installation of the 23 gauge uh, vitrectomy system and removing of silicone oil, the graft was uh, visualized. However, it was found to be fibrosed. So decision was made to remove the graft and select a new harvest site for a retinal transplant. And here we have a video of that. Um, so the, um, the harvest site is uh, outlined with the endo laser and then diathermy is used uh, to um, to the to the harvest site as well, and then pneumatic forceps are used to excise the retina, and the graft is carefully transferred under PF4 to cover the macular hole, and care is taken to uh, properly align the graft here, um, and um, the sclerotomies are very tightly closed with the six of plant gut sutures. Um, Dr. Curran, if he's still on, how do you select the graft site? How do you counsel a patient uh, prior to a procedure like that? And what tamponade do you want to use? So I think with any of these cases, uh, you definitely need to convey to the patient and the family that you're doing sort of like a, a last ditch effort that uh, may not improve the vision. And so they need to really be on board with trying it, knowing that there's a variation in the outcomes. And so that's one of the biggest parts for counseling the patients beforehand. Uh, for this patient, she uh, looked really good on the post-op day one. It looked like the graft was really nicely in place and that it had slipped under the oil. And so we talked to her about one of the other alternatives for tamponading that graft is the short-term PFO. And potentially that can decrease the shift. Um, it's easier to position with that because you just lay flat on your back instead of doing the face down. Um, it's been described um, as fairly well tolerated if you use it for about two weeks, um, but certainly certain issues can come up like inflammation, um, high IOP, and so it's uh, something that is, is not without risk. And so all of those things have to be counseled to the patient as well. For the graft harvest site, um, you need to think about where it's easiest to reach. Um, so if you're going up superior, which would be uh, better in terms of having a longer tamponade if you're using gas, uh, it makes it a lot more difficult to actually mobilize that piece of retina and bring it down to the macula as opposed to starting inferior and then bringing it up to the macula. And so. Um, I usually start my site somewhere inferior and then um, make sure that I have a nice clear path to be able to drag it um, to the macula there. It is really important to make sure that the PFO is still beyond your harvest site because if it's not um, well beyond your harvest site, the graph will float to the top of your PFO bubble and then it's very difficult to get it back down underneath the PFO bubble. And so that's a, a very important consideration to, to have when you're actually doing this. Thank you. Um, so in post-operative uh, op week one, um, she presents with a blurred vision and a pain, is in, a pain in the left eye. Her vision is slightly decreased to hand motion and her uh, intraocular pressure is 60. And this is a, a photograph that I was able to find of representative of what was going on um, with her anterior chamber. Um, Dr. Rupan, are you able to describe what you see here? So I had, had, had our patient had cataract surgery prior? I'm not sure that was mentioned, yes, but uh, I assume after all these retinal surgeries, you mm -hmm. probably needed that. So it looks like there's um, PFO inferiorly. So it's a little, you can call it, I guess, a hypopion-like thing, but a layered PFO inferiorly. I imagine that the anterior chamber's angle is somewhat filled with that, so high pressure, not unusual. Mm -hmm. It was migrated anteriorly, obviously. Right? And the cornea is probably not this clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pressure 60, probably you get a little cloudier cornea, right? Um, so the patient was taken to the operating room for PFO removal, air fluid exchange, and placement of SF6. 
And so we're going to step uh, back and kind of talk about macular holes a little bit. Most common macular holes are primary, um, previously refer referred to as idiopathic, and this already was mentioned before. Um, they thought to occur due to vitreous traction of the foil from anomalous posterior vitreous detachment. They can also occur secondary to trauma, high myopia, ma macular schesis, uh, prior surgery, um, and as well as in cases of macular edema. And pathophysiology involves abnormal uh, vitreous macular interface resulting in tangential as well as anterior posterior uh, traction. Um, so the International Vit uh, Vitreous Macular Traction Study Group has proposed these uh, classification criteria based on the size um, of the macular hole. So the small hole is seen here, and it's measured by aperture size, with the, which is the narrowest hole width. Um, uh, in the mid-retinal layers is seen here. The medium size hole is this photograph, and this is a large size hole, usually larger than 400 micrometers. Um, this photograph um, shows the progression of the vitreo macular interface disorder. So this patient presented with vitreo macular adhesion uh, broad. Um, one year later, he went on to develop vitreo macular traction, and three months after that, um, a full thickness macular hole. And his is, this is his post-operative photograph. Um, it is important to distinguish these uh, from the lamella hole, which is a uh, irregularity of foveal contour. Um, uh, with disruption of inner retinal layers, and as well as pseudo hole, uh, also regular foveal contour of kind of heaped up edges, but no uh, missing retinal tissue, and usually associated with the ERM. Um, so, uh, management options: uh, some the main determining factors in size and chronicity. And I just have a question to the audience: um, uh, When do you decide to in, uh, intervene in macular holes? Typically, typically earlier is better. You don't want to wait too long. The longer you wait, the less favorable the outcome. So if I see a patient in the office, I usually tell them, you know, assuming we're not going to try drops, mm -hmm. which I haven't had too much success with, um, I usually tell them within four to six weeks. It doesn't need to be done within a day or two, but pretty soon. Thank you. And then I would say with a traumatic hole, especially in a young person, I, you know, sometimes we'll wait, although... If it's a good size hole, I don't think it's going to close. Yeah. Small holes you can treat with anti-inflammatories and, and deturges mm -hmm. uh, the edema, and occasionally you'll get uh, closure. And sometimes patients who, who are coming for a third or fourth opinion want you to try that because they're very surgically averse. So it's it's worth trying. But I agree with Mark. You know, it, it, earlier is better than later uh, if you're going to do surgery. Yeah, and from, from our end, the ILM flap has been, what you're seeing at the bottom here, is definitely one of the bigger innovations in the last couple of years. It's definitely allowed us to close some holes that previously we would just sort of throw our hands up and say, we're done. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of us have had some success with some pretty big holes. And uh, the, the autologous retinal transplantation, uh, just kind of skipping to the meat, uh, is, was first described in 2016 for the closure of refractory large myopic macular holes in a patient who already had an ILM flap, and uh, the autologous ILM was not able to be harvested due to anatomy, um, like staphylomas and poor ILM staining um, outside of macula. And uh, that patient also had um, uh, uh, prior cataract extraction, so posterior capsule was not available for graft as well. And it shows a graft integration here. And it uh, proposed mechanisms as scaffold for the glial cell pr proliferation, as well as just to provide a physical plug um, to separating the, severing the communication between the uh, vitreous space and RPE. And there is a... If you go back to that picture, it does look like it, you know, it's on top of adjacent retina there too. Um, so since then, indications have expanded, and here I just want to get to the recently published global consortium on the uh, macular holes uh, with autologous uh, retinal transplantations, and it's looked at 130 eyes worldwide, and the closure rate was found to be 89%, um, and they talk about uh, reconstitution and um, of the... Um, 
uh, neurosensory layers, um, and you can see that you can uh, that postoperatively that uh, week uh, month one there's um, an alignment of the neurosensory layers, like uh, inner plexiform layer aligned with the inner plexiform layer, outer plexiform with outer plexiform here, and it's uh, an unknown exact mechanism for the graft integration, um, but multiple have been proposed, and there's uh, studies yet to be done on, in this area. Uh, so going back to our patient in post-op week one, the visual acuity was 2400, and this is the operative ICT uh, of our patient. And then in post-op year one, the best corrective visual acuity was 2070 um, from original 2400. Uh, the patient is currently following with her a uh, private retina specialist outside of Wells, and this is the postoperative OCD image that they sent us. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kurian, um, Dr. Staff, for providing the uh, surgical video, um, and thank you very much for your attention. I mean, one of the amazing things about that series with 33 different surgeons from around the world was the low complication rate, which is reassuring. Image of the week uh, today comes courtesy of Dr. Berdowski. So this is a cell phone photo of a slit lamp, um, kind of demonstrating that the uh, scope of Wills is not limited by its geography. This is a 20-something-year-old male uh, who was studying in India. Contact lens wear came back in uh, in the States with foreign body sensation and decreased vision. Um, it had these multifocal uh, in infiltrates throughout his cornea. Uh, cultures and uh, uh, biopsy kind of came back, are still negative, uh, but was being treated kind of empirically as microsporidia. So, interesting case from Dr. Bradowski. Uh, hello, my name is Elena Yang. I'm one of the second year residents here at Wills, and I will be presenting today's second case. Uh, this is my disclosures. Um, I have a 64 year old female who presents um, complaining that the corner of her left eye has been turning pink over the last two weeks. She has no past ocular history. Her medical history includes some migraines, anxiety, depression, graves, and hyperlipidemia. She's had uh, reactive iodine, radioactive iodine and thyroidectomy and some other unrelated surgeries. Her medications, um, social and family history as listed. Her review systems included on presentation um, complaints of somewhat blurred vision in both eyes for a couple months, but she denies double vision, eye pain, floaters, or any systemic symptoms. Her vision pinhole to 2040 in the right and 2020 in the left. Um, she came to us in the Wills emergency room, uh, dilated from another eye exam. Um, her pressures, uh, fields to confrontation, color plates were normal. She did demonstrate um, some slight abduction and adduction deficits in her left eye. Here are some photographs. And then some close-ups. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Watson if she could describe what she's seeing here. Sure, so these are external photographs of um, both of the patient's eyes. In that first picture, I think we know that she has a history of graves, so I think um, it's possible that she had some uh, thyroid eye disease manifestations with, she has some fullness of the roof and the soof, um, and maybe a little bit of proptosis, but it could just be in her inherent shallow orbits. But of course, our attention is drawn to when we avert the lid, um, on especially her left eye, uh, the pink lesion that's involving the, the plica and conjunctiva. Um, and it looks like it extends into the inferior fornix and probably also the superior fornix would be my guess if we were to avert uh, the upper lid. And then on in the fellow eye, um, it also looks like she maybe has some pink um, tissue here that could be pathologic. And then also, even kind of within here, this looks thickened in the photograph. But certainly, again, sorry, I forgot I had the laser pointer. This is kind of that primary lesion that our attention is drawn to. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And another close-up, uh, this is of the left eye here. Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so as Dr. Watson mentioned, thank you. Uh, so a nasal salmon-colored subconjunctival lesion um, was appreciated in both eyes, uh, rather significant um, in the left eye. Um, this is a picture of our right optic nerve. Just let you take a look at that for now. Looks like the left. Sorry, uh, uh, the, the left, okay. Um, this is a photograph I'd like to ask Dr. Dunn if he could describe perhaps what he's seeing here. So this is a wide field image of the right eye. Uh, the optic nerve looks um, possibly a little bit swollen. Um, the vessels are somewhat obscured at the disc margins, um, maybe a little pale as well. Uh, it doesn't look hyperemic. Uh, what's particularly notable is the frosted branch angiitis appearance. Um, so you see what looks like peri-arterial involved, diffuse peri-arterial involvement uh, that extends really in 360 degrees. Um, no hemorrhages that I see. Okay. So it looks like a periarteritis. Um, and of the left eye. And the left eye, a wide field color image shows a more normal appearing optic disc. There's no edema, there's no pallor. A cup to disc looks normal. Border margins are good. No vascular changes in this eye. Retina looks pretty unremarkable. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Um, so as mentioned, um, on presentation, she was noted to have two plus vitreous cell actually in her right eye. We weren't able to capture that necessarily by photographs. Um, she also had disc edema um, in that eye with uh, some perivascular changes. Uh, Dr. Polito, if I could ask for your input on these photographs. So the fundus autofluorescence um, um, Photographs of uh, both eyes appear pretty unremarkable. Uh, don't see anything significant. Um, and this is an FA of the right eye. And this um, begins in the laminar venous phase at 30 seconds in the right eye and uh, shows that there is uh, disc leakage. Um, from the swollen disc that uh, Dr. Dunn had um, talked about. And um, there is some staining of the vessels, but it's pretty quiet. Um, and there's no significant um, macular edema nor staining of the peripheral vessels where there was marked uh, periarteritis. Uh, yeah, there is a little bit uh, in furrow nasally here, um, but uh, not, in com not as dramatic as what could be seen by color photographs. Does that suggest to you that it's relatively inactive, that this could be, you know, perivascular sheathing? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's inactive. I, I, there's definitely something that looks active there, but it, it simply means that it's as you say, periarterial R and not arterial R. So there's no occlusive vasculopathy here, and that's characteristic for a frosted branch angiitis. So you have to be careful with the term vasculitis. Uh, and Dr. Eagle could tell us more if Dr. Millman is here, but you know, to a to a rheumatologist, vasculitis implies <clears throat> infiltration of inflammatory cells into the vessel wall. We use the term vasculitis ophthalmologically in a much looser sense and more of a morphologic and certainly not a histopathologic diagnosis. Um, so you can see these changes that are uh, perivascular in which you don't get any uh, vascular occlusion and your flourishing angi angiogram can be in fact completely normal or as in this case, you know, mildly abnormal out in that infranasal uh, mid periphery of the right eye. We also have an FA of the other, uh, the opposite eye here. And, um, you know, it's difficult to um, evaluate the far uh, periphery because there's always changes that one can't be really sure if they're real or not. Um, there might be a little bit of capillary dropout. But if you told me that it was 
um, normal, I would accept it as well. Um, here I have an OCT of the right eye. Uh, Dr. Shields, if I can ask what um, you might be seeing here. Yeah, so OCT through the macula, the top is the horizontal cut. Uh, the inner retina looks thin. The nerve fiber layer looks thin and irregular. Um, in the subfoveal area, there looks like there might be just a tad of subretinal fluid. I'll point it out. Right there. Um, and you can see the irregularity of the nerve fiber layer, suggesting that there might be, you know, inner retinal ischemia or post inflammatory thinning. Um, the RPE looks fine, outer retinal laminations look okay. We're losing a little bit of the laminations temporally. Uh, the choroid, uh, we don't have really good vascular markings in the choroid. It doesn't look thickened, but it, we don't see the choroidal vessels as well as one might expect. And then on this vertical cut, you can see there is uh, shallow subretinal fluid with a little bit of shaggy photoreceptors. And again, that inner retinal thinning with uh, irregularity. And over uh, here, this would be uh, more inferiorly um, that we lose the architecture within the retina. And of the left eye here as well. So the left eye is looking a lot better. We have a nice foveal contour, uh, a nice ellipsoid zone. Uh, the choroid, you can see the choroidal vascular architecture on both the horizontal cut and then down below on the vertical cut. Thank you. Uh, so as noted, um, anteriorly we have this very prominent left anterior conjunctival lesion. Um, but in the right eye, we have some very prominent uh, retinal findings um, posteriorly. Um, Dr. Shields, what would you, if this person, presuming she was still in the Wills ER at the time, would you like to do uh, in terms of next steps? Well, I'd like to know how uh, extensive this conjunctival lesion is, so I might want to consider an MRI scan or a CT scan, but MRI would be uh, show detail better. Um, I would ask her a history of uh, her systemic health. Um, I'm thinking just based on this conjunctival lesion, I want to rule out uh, a lymphoid process. I want to rule out amyloidosis. I want to rule out sarcoidosis, which can all have a very similar picture. Thank you. Um, so some imaging was obtained at this time. Um, some representative photographs were, are shown here. So she had an MRI brain and orbits with and without, um, showing uh, first a left preceptal enhancing mass abutting the left globe with ventral bulbar intraconal fat infiltration and an ill-defined enhancement of the posterior sclera and distal optic nerve sheath complex. She was also found to have a dural-based mass overlying the parietal lobe on the right and then some focal tissue lesions within her nares. Um, she did have some basic labs, um, including uh, CBC, BMP, uh, inflammatory labs, and Lyme, syphilis, and quant gold um, at this time. Um, it was decided that we would proceed with a conjunctival biopsy. Um, we did ask about, so in terms of her review systems, she did feel relatively healthy and had denied any weight loss um, upon presentation. So no B symptoms at all? Uh, this is a uh, pathology slide, Dr. Milman, if I can ask for your input here. Yes, yeah, so here we can see a conjunctiva with a um, sheet-like uh, pretty monotonous infiltrate of lymphocytes. And if you go to higher magnification, you can see that these um, are atypical lymphocytes with uh, pretty regular nuclear counters and prominent nucleoli. And when you compare the size uh, to normal lymphocyte, they're two to three times larger, which is compatible with large cell lymphoma. Um, you also, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, can see that there are prominent um, mitotic figures and uh, apoptotic bodies. So this is a high-grade large cell lymphoma. So in cases like that, we generally do immunohistochemical panels to characterize this process. 
And um, CD20 uh, B cell marker shows that these are malignant B cells, uh, which are much more numerous when you compare them to CD3 positive T cells. And uh, these B cells apparently co-express CD5, and then they're also positive for BCL2, BCL6, MAM1, they overexpress MIC, and um, they are negative for cyclin D1 as well as other markers um, that we do for higher grade lymphoma. Then uh, we also, in these cases, uh, the differential diagnosis now is between diffuse large B cell lymphoma and high grade B cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 or BCL6 rearrangement. So these cases have to be pursued by uh, fluorescent situ hybridization studies looking for rearrangement of these genes because uh, MIC rearranged lymphomas are much more aggressive. In this case, there was no rearrangement in MIC uh, gene. However, um, uh, so this is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but this lymphoma expresses CD5 and expresses immunohistochemically uh, MIC, BCL2, and BCL6, and that is associated with unfavorable prognosis. So this would be a less common type of conjunctival lymphoid process because the most common type of lymphoma that we see is malt lymphoma. Second is follicular, and way down the list is diffuse large B cell yeah, lymphoma. Yeah, in general, this is a very unusual lymphoma period. No matter what site, uh, CD5 positive diffuse large B cell lymphomas, they're not common. And here the question is, is it really primary, you know, ocular adnexal lymphoma? Um, you know, this patient may have actually systemic disease. Yeah, this is not boom boom therapy type of uh, lymphoma. This patient needs a big time oncological uh, work. Uh, yeah. Pet scan, whole body pet scan uh, workup because um, it's ocular until it's only ocular until proven that it is. It's, it's systemic until proven otherwise. Wasn't there a mass in the parietal lobe, too? Yeah. There was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I think she had history of plasma cell myeloma, right? She, so she had other malignancies. Family history of Oh, cancer. family history, OK. So it's not a Richter's transformation. <laughs> no. Yes, uh, so um, she had oncologic workup, at least uh, in part from what I understand at Jefferson, where they did bone marrow biopsy, which showed process that is similar to what we saw in the conjunctiva. And then they also do CSF study. And what's interesting here is that based on the immunoglobulin heavy chain rearrangement studies, these look like two clonally distinct <coughs> processes. So we have different clones in CNS and different clone in the bone marrow and ocular adnexa, kind of. Uh, so with regards to the patient course, January is when she initially presented with this worsening uh, described redness in her left eye. She had an Im imaging at that time. It was actually evaluated by a neuro-oncologist who thought that the dural-based mass on her initial imaging uh, was actually a benign meningioma and not related at all to the rest of her ocular presentation, her lymphoma. Um, she had the biopsy done just a little while uh, later, as well as the bone marrow biopsy and lumbar puncture. Um, later on, she did have a, a, a PET scan that showed rather diffuse uh, systemic activity, um, and she was started on uh, RCHOP at that time. Um, in April, she had repeat imaging that then showed new enhancement uh, within uh, the frontal lobe and cerebellar hemispheres. Um, and it was thought at that time she uh, was demonstrating like early uh, both leptomeningeal and parenchymal metastasis. Uh, the dural-based lesion that was seen from the original imaging was stable. Um, she was started on high-dose methotrexate, but unfortunately developed toxicity in response to that. She had repeat imaging then uh, a little late while later that showed worsening leptomeningeal disease, and so she received whole brain uh, radiotherapy um, and then resumed RCHOP after that. Other options were discussed at that time, but were not initiated. Um, unfortunately, uh, later on, uh, she did develop failure to thrive, um, 
she had repeat imaging after all the whole brain radiotherapy and RCHOP um, that actually did demonstrate significant improvement clinically um, of the lymphoma uh, through, uh, through her body as well as actually in her brain meds. Um, but unfortunately, she was very fatigued by all of her medical visits um, and she did electro home hospice. Um, so th thinking about like both concurrent and uh, like orbital and intraocular lymphoma is, is a rather rare experience and we don't really think about them in the same bins. They're, they're completely different in terms of their presentation and, and uh, what we're looking for. So with regards to orbital um, lymphoma, we think of mostly tumors that originate from adnexal structures like the eyelid and lacrimal gland and conjunctiva. It's a very common primary malignant orbital tumor, um, usually a low-grade lymphoma, whereas intraocular lymphoma is very rare even amongst intraocular tumors and uh, usually rather high-grade. Um, patients that present with uh, orbital lymphoma um, may complain of a chronic red eye, proptosis, or double vision. And on exam, you might see if it, uh, there's conjunctival involvement, a classic salmon patch appearance, which we did see in our patient, um, as well as restriction in EOMs, um, periorbital edema, ptosis, or a firm pal palpable mass. Um, compared to intraocular lymphoma, where the patient might complain of blurred vision and floaters, and we might see vitreous cells, retinal, uh, retinal and choroidal infiltrates, um, RDs. Um, in these patients. Um, the differential is rather broad for both, um, as listed there. And with regards to treatment, the patient may receive a radiotherapy, plus or minus chemo in either cases, and discussion of possible like intravitreal um, methotrexate and intraocular lymphoma. Uh, very briefly, primary vitreal retinal lymphoma um, very frequently does involve the brain either on initial presentation or subsequently. Um, so 60 to 90 percent of primary vitreal retinal lymphoma involve the brain subsequently, while um, patients who initially present with primary central nervous system lymphoma will develop uh, it, the vitreal retinal involvement later. Um, this is an entity that's very commonly known as a masquerade syndrome, um, and uh, Patients may complain of floaters and blurred vision for many years or months before uh, they reach a, def a definite diagnosis. Um, very frequently, these patients can report improvement in their symptoms with oral and intraocular steroids, um, further delaying kind of the definite diagnosis. Um, and then pathologically, it's also very challenging to diagnose this because uh, vitreous or retinal biopsies are um, usually up you obtain very little material and not necessarily great quality. There's maybe, there may not be many like neoplastic cells and they may be very fragile. Um, so a number of factors can actually lead you to uh, obtain, basically end up with like a high rate of um, false negative vitreous biopsies. May I ask um, JP or Jose, so in this patient there was this um, white opacification around the retinal vessels and some vitreous uh, cells. Uh, is that in keeping with involvement of intraocular tissues by lymphoma, either systemic kind of second, in, secondarily involving the eye? Yeah, I, I think that's the case. And um, what uh, 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 JP was um, talking about, uh, I published a paper that, sh uh, that discussed that um, with vitreoretinal lymphoma, and the paper was mis subsequently misquoted, um, uh, with vitreoretinal lymphoma, um, you um, many times don't see cystoid macular edema, but that doesn't mean it's all the time. So if you see cells in the vitreous and don't have macular edema, you have to think about it. Um, while when you have uveitis with T cells, you get macular edema. The B cells, um, uh, 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 release cytokines um, that uh, close the blood retinal barrier and uh, to protect themselves from um, the, uh, T the um, killer T cells that are coming after them. And it's a perfect environment, that, therefore, for them. So if you don't see CME in the presence of cells, think of um, large B cell lymphoma, but 15% um, have macular edema with inf inflammatory T cells in the vitreous. And this is, by the way, L265P. And also infiltrating the optic nerve. And it's interesting, it was so unilateral when the conjunctival problem was worse on the other eye. Mm 
Yeah, and there was choroidal infiltration, yeah. which is so odd for vitreoretinal lymphoma. You generally don't get choroidal in so that would infiltration. Suggest, yeah, that would suggest that it's a systemic yeah. disease su with secondary intraocular involvement. So in most cases where we see frosted branchiitis, we think of infectious problems, and it's been reported in syphilis, tuberculosis, acute retinal necrosis, toxoplasmosis, but it's also been reported in lymphoproliferative disorders. So. Um, just, uh, this is a study that was published in 2015, case report of a primary intraocular lymphoma um, that infiltrated the iris and uh, posterior, like extraocular tissues. Um, the authors here had had uh, uh, diagnosed the tissue type also as a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and they detected the tumor cells because they had an, obviously enucleated the eye, um, not only in the sclera itself, but also perivascular areas within the sclera. So they had uh, supposed in this case that there um, potentially that the patient had developed a primary intraocular tumor that had then um, invaded uh, the nearby tissues through those scleral vessels or small scleral vessels. Um, this patient did not have any evidence of systemic or CNS involvement. Um, with trying to find other patients who had both kind of simultaneous presentation of intraocular and extraocular lymphoma, it's very, I, I wasn't really able to find too much about this, but there was another uh, report that came out um, that in which the authors described three cases of concurrent choroidal and periocular involvement, um, and they rely very heavily on uh, their B-scan um, to kind of define uh, choroidal thickening and choroidal masses adjacent to these periocular like tissues, um, periocular like tumors. Um, and in two of these cases, they described uh, what they thought to be mostly a primary intraocular lymphoma, and the third patient had had a history of systemic B cell lymphoma that was previously treated 14 years prior, um, and his ocular tumor on presentation was considered to be like an early metastasis. We gotta, we've got to talk about what is, see the problem is nomenclature, and so yes, this is intraocular lymphoma, but this is choroidal lymphoma. Yeah, and it's common to see it with orbital lymphoma. That's common. Correct. Yeah, the model lymphoma is classic, you know, intraocular model lymphoma is very frequently have uh, associated extraocular disease. Right, so you'd have to separate that from oh. true primary vitreo retinal right. lymphoma right. that does yeah. not involve the right. choroid. Right. And just based on the ultrasound here, uh, one, two, and three, I see no vitreous cells. I might see one cell here. Uh, so it okay. makes you feel like this is mostly choroidal with extrascleral extension, which is more common. Right. Uh, so there really, if anyone has any thoughts about any presentations of uh, other like primary vitreoretinal lymphoma with extraocular extension, um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find too much about that. Rush into publication. <laughs> but this is a systemic lymphoma yeah. with yeah. secondary ocular and intraocular yeah. involvement. Yeah. Uh, per right, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps I should have looked at more of just oncology journals and said they probably wouldn't have noted the eye involvement. That's a possibility. Um, just with regards to brief note about uh, you know orbital and um, ocular and CNS lymphoma can also masquerade uh, as a um, retinitis. Um, so something just to keep in mind as well. Um, the kind of angiocentric or frosted by uh, branch angiitis appearance of our patients' uh, retinal involvement is also very interesting. Just kind of, I'm trying to, I conjecture about the uh, reading I've done with regards to diffuse or uh, primary uh, CNS lymphoma. They do report that um, that CNS lymphoma is characterized by um, an angiocentric appearance pathologically with um, inflammatory and lymphomatous cells surrounding small blood vessels. So. Not really sure if that may be related to this at all. But, but remember, too, what uh, Dr. Dunn said. The first case report up there is actually um, uh, a misnomer. Um, it was AIDS associated, but it was a uh, CMV driven um, lymphoma, um, which is a, a different situation. Uh, so in summary, we had this 64-year-old female who had uh, presented with worsening redness in the left eye, and her initial exam was concerning for a conjunctival lymphoma. 
um, as, as well as vitriol retinal um, involvement. Um, her biopsy did show diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and her systemic workup did eventually reveal she had widespread lymphoma with CNS involvement and ocular involvement. Um, she had received uh, whole chemo and whole brain radiotherapy with some improvement um, clinically, but uh, she did not decide to pursue um, uh, ongoing treatment. Here are my references. I just want to thank Dr. Shields, Dr. Millman, uh, actually Dr. Armstrong too, who helped provide some of those pictures um, in my class. Thank you.